Uh, good morning. My name is Alan Hammersmith, and I'm a technical consultant and an instructor with the Educational Services Department, and I'm based out of the Boston Regional Office in Massachusetts. Joining me today is Mike Hogan, who is a technical lead with server support here in Redlands, California. We want to welcome you all to today's live training seminar. Uh, today we'll be reviewing uh, several topics related to ArcGIS Server Setup and Administration. First, we'll take a look at the architecture of the product, which will help us understand exactly what gets installed and how to better troubleshoot issues when they arise. Next, we'll take a look at the users that are part of the ArcGIS Server system and also how to manage the users within your site. User permissions can be a bit tricky if you're not familiar with what the users are designed to do, so we'll spend some time reviewing this as well. For the last topic, we'll review some of the configurable properties of ArcGIS Server, including overall site properties, as well as properties specific to a map service. Each section will have an associated demonstration, which will help illustrate these concepts. At the end of each section, we will also have time to answer any questions, so please feel free to submit those, and we will answer as many as we can. So let's start by examining the architecture of ArcGIS Server, so we can get a better understanding of the system. At a high level, ArcGIS Server has a three-tier architecture, where the top tier is the web server. The job of the web server is to handle all the communication from the outside world to the GIS server. This communication is accomplished either via a web application, which users can open in web browsers, or by a web service endpoint, which will allow clients such as ArcMap to connect to your services through the internet. The next tier is the GIS server, where all of your GIS services will run, such as map or geoprocessing services. The GIS server manages the load balancing of incoming requests to the appropriate service, as well as processing the client requests by accessing the data on the data server. Now, this data server is the third tier and could be as simple as a file server for storing your file based resources, or it could also be an ArcSDE server used to manage large numbers of database transactions. Now, while it's possible and even quite common to have all these tiers on one machine, you can also spread them across several machines to help in load distribution, availability, and redundancy. Now, before we move on, I'd like to take a closer look at the GIS server. While it can logically be considered a black box, the GIS server actually consists of two internal components. The first is the Server Object Manager, or SOM. For every instance of ArcGIS server, you'll have a single SOM process, as seen in the task manager here. The SOM is the manager of the instance and is not a very heavyweight process. Its job is just to listen for incoming requests from clients and pass them to the appropriate service. The services will run within the server object container, or SOC process. Uh, these are the processes that are doing all the heavy lifting on the server. They will handle all the requests forwarded by the SOM by accessing the necessary GIS resources. For example, for a map service, the SOC process may use its ARC SD connection to request data at a certain extent and draw a map in a JPEG file to be returned to the client. In the screenshot here, you can see that while we have a single ARC SOM process, there are four ARC SOC processes running on our system. The number of SOCs you will have will vary and we'll get into how we can control that in the final section. So let's take a look at the different ways our clients can access ArcGIS Server. Using the web server, users have a couple options for accessing our system. One way to access your services is by using ArcGIS applications, such as ArcMap or ArcGIS Explorer, and making an internet connection to the service's web service endpoint. If your users don't have such clients, you will need to provide a web mapping application so that they can open it up in a web browser. For any clients on our local area network, they can use additional way to connect to our service by making a local connection directly into the GIS server. Local connections bypass the web server altogether and communicate directly with the SOM. This may be helpful if any shared resources are used that exist on our network. And of course, you can also connect directly into your data server by making an ArcSDE connection. This would be used by the editors of your data or by anyone that wants to use the data right from the source. 
Now, when building your web mapping application, ArcGIS Ser Server Manager provides you with a simple interface to choose the type of connection your application will use. When choosing which type to use, treat your web application as you would any other client, except that it's running on your web server. You can configure this application to use several types of connections. The first one is an ArcGIS Server Local Connection. This is the same as the local connection we already discussed, but is created within a web mapping application. Your clients will still access the application through the web server, but the application will connect to the service using a local connection. This gives us more options for building specialized GIS functionality into our app, since local connections can leverage ARC objects. If the service you're using in your application has web access enabled, and you don't need any specialized JS functionality that uses custom ARC objects code, then you should use an internet connection. This way, your application will use the web service endpoint that has been created on the web server, and this results in a less chatty communication with the JS server. We also have a few other options for services that are used in your application, as seen in the screenshot here from the Create Web Application Wizard. In addition to ArcGIS services, you can choose to use services hosted from ArcIMS, ArcWeb services, or WMS services on the web. Now, following the author serve use model for ArcGIS Server, we start out an ArcGIS desktop for our authoring tool. Which type of resource we recre recreate will depend on which type of service we can publish. For a map service, we'll create an MXD and ArcMap by connecting to our data server. This is where many of the properties of our service get set, such as data access, rendering information, and so on. Now, we've created our resources. We can serve them up using our catalog by creating services. We can also use our catalog to configure the service properties after it's been created, or it can also be done at creation time. When using our catalog, you will need to be on the local area network, as administrative connections are always made as local connections and not internet connections. Once the service has been created, now we're ready to use it. We can do so by using ArcGIS applications as mentioned earlier, or we can use ArcGIS Server Manager to build a web mapping application. Now clients can use the service through a browser. Manager also gives us the ability to manage services as we did in our catalog, which can be especially useful when you're not on the network. Now we'll show you some of the basic tasks that all administrators should know how to perform. I'll show you how to make an administrative connection to ArcGIS Server and create a service using that connection. Then I'll demonstrate how you can add this service to a web mapping application. So here in our catalog, we can see that I have in this JS servers in the table of contents on the left-hand side. And under here, there's a, a link here for me to add an ArcGIS Server. So if I double-click this link, I double click this link, that opens the Add ArcGIS Server dialog. And here I can, because I'm an administrator, I want to choose the Manage GIS Servers option. And I click Next, I need to put in the URL for my server and also the host name. Because as administrative connections are used uh, as local connections, so I need to have the host that the SOM process is running on. And when I click Finish, you can see I now have this administrative connection uh, within my GIS servers item, but I don't have any map services running just yet. So now, what I first thing I want to do is to create a service is I'm going to uh, access, locate an MXD that I've already created. And this, the MXD I'm going to use for this uh, demo is going to be this California MXD. So our catalog makes it really easy to create services. I just have to right click publish to ArcGIS Server, and because I've already made an administrative connection, that shows up here in the ArcGIS Server dropdown. If I had several administrative connections, then they would also show up here. Service name is, this, by default, will be the same name as the MXD, and I'm going to put it in the root folder, but I could also create additional folders if I wanted to organize my services. I click Next, and in the next screen, I can choose which capabilities I'd like to enable. I'm just going to keep the defaults, and I'm going to click Finish. And now this is publishing my California MXD. And now I can preview it also within Art Catalog. 
here we can see just a simple service with just a few different layers of some cities and earthquakes for the state of California. Right, so now what I'd like to do is actually show this in ArcGIS Server Manager. So if I come, if I log in to ArcGIS Server Manager, I log in to ArcGIS Server Manager, I'll notice that on the Service tab, I can also see that same California service. That's because both Arc Catalog and ArcGIS Server Manager are looking at the same instance of ArcGIS Server. And I can also preview this service using the thumbnails here within uh, my Services tab. Now what I'd like to do is create an application for this. And I'm going to call this uh, California. And I'll give you a short description just so I know exactly why I created this. I click Next. And now the first step I need to do is to add in my ArcGIS server. So I don't have any listed. I don't have any listed yet. So the way I do this is I want to add an ArcGIS server internet connection. And I put in the URL of my server. And then I add that in. And now you can see that it'll show up on the left-hand side, and if I expand this, here's the California service that I just created. And now this is using an internet connection. So for the rest of them, I'm going to accept the defaults and just click Finish. And now this will open up in a new window. Let me bring this down so you can see it. And now this application, uh, can I can access my California service using a web browser. And I can again zoom in and see some of the other layers pretty straightforward. So in review, we've discussed three-tier architecture of ArcGIS server, made of a web server, GIS server, and data server, and also the internal SOM and SOC components of the GIS server. We reviewed the different ways one can use ArcGIS server, including the various connection types available for web mapping application. And lastly, we talked briefly about some of the tasks you'll perform as an administrator of ArcGIS server. Now we'll go to Mike, who will answer some of the questions you've submitted. Mike? Thanks, Alan. We've got uh, quite a few questions coming in from lots of people. So first, we're going to take a question from Dory from Grapevine, who asks, which machine should be a SOM? Um, should I put my SOM on a web server or a machine with, uh, say, SQL Server? Well, the answer to that is really the SOM component is a lightweight component and it can actually be installed on, on any machine you like. It's not, you know, in a single machine configuration, you would put them all on a, all on a single server, but the, the SOM component could be put on a different server. So it's really going to come down to uh, where you have the resources to put the SOM and licensing. So when you install additional components on different machines, it's going to require a different licensing scheme. All right, next question comes from uh, Don in Canada, who asks, is ArcGIS Server 9.2 hard-coded to expect the exist, uh, existence of the default website or the INET pub directory? Some clients uh, don't want to put everything all on the default website. So the answer to this is that at 9.2, it is hard-coded to go to the default website in IIS for the .NET version. Uh, at 9.3, they're working on some ways to be able to uh, put your websites in other, in other websites rather than the default. Um, there is a manual way to do this at currently at 9.2. And if you take a look on our ESRI support website, support.esri.com, and search for a knowledge base article, uh, it's number 33314, it'll give you the manual steps on how to set that up on a non-default website. Okay, next question comes from Owen from Vienna, who asks, is it possible to have more than one SOM per ArcGIS server instance on different physical machines, either for load balancing, redundancy, or failover? And yeah, that's a great question. So yes, it is possible to have more than one SOM, and that's kind of recommended, actually, if you want a failover situation. So a, you have multiple SOC pr uh, processes. Each SOC can only talk to a single SOM, but we can have multiple SOMs if we want, specifically usually for a uh, load balancing or a failover situation in case one of those SOMs stops processing. And we have a question from David from Woods Hole who asks, uh, since we only use Linux servers, 
Can you talk about the differences between Windows and Linux flavors for ArcGIS Server? So we do support Linux. We support Linux Red Hat Enterprise 4 and SUSE Linux 9. Now, with the Linux version, uh, we have the ArcGIS Server Java edition, which will run on our Linux systems. The .NET version is, is specifically for Windows. So you'll have to use the Java version. Uh, it's fully supported. You can install it on, fully on, a, on one of those supported Linux systems. And there's some tools within the Linux manager that will allow you to uh, manage Windows, or not, sorry, manage users and groups, which uh, Alan, I think, is going to get to in the next, uh, next section here. OK, so that's all we have for questions right now. I'll pass you back to Alan. All right, thanks, Mike. So as Mike mentioned in this next section, uh, we're going to discuss the various users that are part of the ArcGIS server system and also some of the permissions necessary and that so that everything can work smoothly. So first we'll talk about the service accounts that are created during the post installation and which these enable ArcGIS server to run. Uh, then we'll get into how to specify who are the users and also who are the administrators of your system. And lastly, we'll discuss uh, some important things regarding permissions for database users. And we'll also compare some of the differences between database and OS authentication. So when you run the post installation for ArcGIS Server, there are several users that get created. And these are required to run ArcGIS Server. So in the screenshot here of Task Manager, you'll notice that the user that the ArcSOM process is running as is the ArcGIS SOM user. Uh, the only job of the ArcGIS SOM user is to run this process, and all the necessary permissions are set for you during the post installation for this user. And now the same thing holds true for the ArcSOC process, except, of course, that these processes are running as the ArcGIS SOC user. Uh, one thing you want to watch out for is that this ArcGIS SOC account will need permission explicitly granted to any of the GIS resources uh, that are required to run your services. Now, these resources could be your data, map documents, toolboxes, or anything else that you uh, wish to publish or use in your services. So in addition to these two accounts, uh, there's another local user that gets created, and this depends on which platform you're using with ArcGIS Server. So if you're using the .NET platform, then you'll have an ArcGIS Web Services user account. And this is used by IIS in order to communicate with the GIS server. If you're using the Java platform, uh, you'll have a user called ArcGIS Manager on your machine. Uh, this account is a generic account used for logging into ArcGIS Server Manager. Now, all of these accounts are created as local machine accounts, as there's no need for them to be domain users, even in a distributed installation. So during the post installation, you also have the option to change these usernames if you wish, though I usually accept the defaults. Now, for the actual users of your system, there are two Windows groups that get created on your server. The first one is the AGS admin group. This is used to define who are the administrators of ArcGIS Server. So members of this group are able to create, modify, or delete GIS services. If you're using the .NET platform, then these users will also have to be in the local administrators group, which will enable them to successfully log into ArcGIS Server Manager, and then they'll be permitted to deploy web applications within IIS. And this is a security mechanism that's imposed by the .NET framework within IIS. So for the users of my system that don't need to create or modify services, but just need to use them, they will be, need to be added to the AGS users group. If I already have existing groups at my site, for example, a domain group called Water Department, I can nest this group within the local AGS users group, and now anyone in the Water Department group will be able to use my services. So there's a few things to consider in this regard. First off, this is only for local connections made to ArcGIS Server. This doesn't apply to internet connections. Uh, there's actually a separate mechanism for restricting access for internet connections, which is fully documented in the ArcGIS Server help. Also, the SOM and SOC users are not part of these groups. Sometimes when I visit clients, they mistakenly have added the SOC and SOM accounts to these groups in a troubleshooting effort. But that's not required. It's not going to help you in any way. Next thing is that these groups must be local groups, uh, and they can't be domain groups. There's no reason they would really need to be domain groups, although existing domain users or groups can be added within these local uh, ArcGIS server groups. 
And for the Unix users out there, uh, probably wondering, well, what are you going to do? But there's actually a parallel process that mirrors this functionality for you in order to manage your users. And this is all handled from within the ArcGIS Server Manager. Uh, the last type of user that we'll discuss are database users. Now keep in mind this only applies for ARC SDE geodatabases. So if you are only using file-based data, this won't apply to you. Now for relational databases, there are two types of authentication which can be used to check if a particular user is allowed to access the database or not. So the first one is database authentication, which stores the user information within the database and the user is prompted for a username and password when a connection is made. This type of authentication is only used with ARC SDE Enterprise for Oracle or for SQL Server. Now for OS authentication, there are no additional users necessary to be created in the database as the user information is stored as part of the operating system. When a connection is made using OS authentication, the database asks the operating system if this is a valid user and if so, then the connection is successfully made. It is important to note that this type of authentication is always used by ArcSD Workgroup, as well as ArcSD Enterprise with DB2 and Informix. If you choose to, you can also use OS authentication with Oracle and SQL Server as well. Now, by default, the ArcGIS SOC account is only granted minimal permissions sufficient enough to run the ArcSoc EXE. You have to explicitly grant permissions for the ArcGIS SOC user account in order to give it access to all of your JS resources. This is especially true if your resources are on shared drives or within ArcSDE using OS authentication. Now let's take a look at a scenario to see how this works. So here I have my data server running ArcSDE, and I'm going to publish two different services in ArcGIS server one using an MXD created with database authentication, and another MXD created with OS authentication. Now, before I can connect with database authentication, I must have a valid user that exists in the database, in this case, GIS user. When I make my connection in ArcMap, I specify this account, so then I am connected to the database as that GIS user. Then I can add in all my layers and then save off my MXD. When I publish this MXD to ArcGIS server, the service will also connect to the database uh, as the JS user using database authentication, and everything works as expected. Now, in the next case, I want to connect to the data using OS authentication, meaning I'll connect to the database using my Windows login. So whenever establishing a new connection to the database, you need to make sure that, that login is a valid user in the database. So here you can see I've added the domain slash Allen user to my database. Then when I connect in ArcMap using OS authentication, I have no problem making a connection to the data. And I can add in the layers to my MXD. The tricky part is when I then try to publish the MXD to ArcGIS server. So since I've specified the connection as OS authentication and the ArcSoc EXE is running as the ArcGIS SOC user, your service will not work since that login has not been added as a valid user to the database. Once you add that user to the database and grant the necessary permissions, the service will then work as expected. So now I'll illustrate what this problem looks like by using an MXD configured with ArcSD workgroup data and publishing it to ArcGIS server. So for this demo, I'm going to use this Redlands MXD, which I've already created. And if you, I come down here to the source tab, you'll notice that it's coming from within SQL Express, which is where my ARC SDE workgroup instance is. Right. So now I want to uh, publish this MXD, and I'm going to do that right again through our, our catalog. So here's my Redlands MXD, and just like I did before, I published to ArcGIS server, click Next, Next, and Finish. Now it looks like the service got created, and I might think I'm all done, but when I try to preview this, I get this error that says, cannot display this layer. The data source referenced by this layer may be missing or corrupted. Well, that's a pretty good indicator that the ArcSoc process can't find the data that it's looking for. So since this data is in my SDE workgroup instance, I'm going to go there to make sure that they have permission. So here in my 
SQL Express instance, I have two databases, one of them being Redlands, which uh, is where the data from that MXD is coming from. If I right-click the instance and go down to permissions, it shows me that I'm logged in as the LTS user, and that's actually the only user that's been added to this uh, database instance. So in order to add that, I need to click the add user, and in this case, it's just called the SOC account on encoder one, and I click OK, and now that SOC user has been added uh, to my database uh, instance. The thing I need to do is grant them permissions within the database so they can actually see the data. So I do that by right-clicking on the database that I want them to have access to, go down to administration, and over to permissions. So since I've added them to the workgroup instance, they show up here, and now I can grant them read-only access to the data because they just need to read that data, and they're not going to be making any edits to it. So this will give them access to all of the feature classes within this Redlands uh, database. If I wanted to, I could have gone through at more detail to grant, explicitly grant them permission on just a single feature class. But I granted them to everything within that database. So now that they have permission uh, to that necessary data, all I have to do now is stop my service and restart it in order for those changes to take effect. So now when the service restarts, we can see now that that service is working uh, as expected. And I can zoom in and make uh, you know, whatever queries I, I would like against it. So that was the problem, is that you need to make sure that that ArcGIS SOC user has permissions uh, to your data. Okay, so now we have a review question. So please locate the review question link in the upper left corner of your browser and click it now. So the review question is, who is responsible for granting permissions for the ArcGIS SOC account in order for it to access your JS resources, such as data, MXDs, or shared drives. So is it A, this is not necessary, the ArcGIS SOC account always has access? Is it B, the post installation sets these permissions for you? Is it C, you as the administrator have to set these explicitly? Or D, these will be set automatically when the service starts? So to submit your answer, click A, B, C, or D, and then click the send button. So in summary, uh, just describe the various types of users that exist with ArcGIS Server. We've talked about the service accounts that get created from the post installation, and we also went over the way to define what your local users are permitted to do depending on the Windows group they're part of. Then we got into database users, and I just described some of the differences between database and OS authentication and how that relates to the permissions necessary for the ArcGIS SOC account. So now at this point, I'd like to turn it over again to Mike to answer some more of your questions. All right, thanks, Alan. So we have a question from David from Moon Township who asks, what's the difference between the ArcGIS server local and ArcGIS server internet connections? And so really the difference is uh, local connection is going to be used, it's going to uh, pick from users that are in your AGS users or AGS admin group, and they're going to be local users on your network. So, and you're going to use a local connection, usually for more advanced functionality for, say, Arc Objects functionality that you may have in a custom application. The internet connection is going to be used for people, really, that are anonymous or out on the internet to be able to connect and use your, your ArcGIS server or, or use your, your web service. Okay, next question is from Betty from Houston, who asks, do I need to log on to the server as an administrator? Um, so you have to be part of the AGS admin group to be able to log into ArcGIS Server Manager. And you also, if you're using the .NET version, you do need to have your, your Windows user account in the local administrators group. Now, this is a requirement specifically for the .NET version of server to allow you to create web applications and have some interaction with IIS. Okay, next question comes from Khalid in Baghdad, who asks, if a SOC user can't access the data used in an MXD file, can we still make it available as a service in ArcGIS Server? 
And the answer to that is no. So if if the SOC user, if that SOC account doesn't have access, it's the service may still publish, but you're not going to be able to see any of those data layers, and you're probably going to get a blank map back. So it's really important that your SOC, that SOC account has access to all of your MXDs, your data, and any supporting resources that are included in that for it to all publish and work correctly on the server. Okay, next question is from uh, Nat Rajan from Manama, who asks, is there any particular port that should be open for the web server and ArcGIS server? Um, so this is going to depend again on which, which uh, version you're using. If you're using the .NET version, you're, gonna, you're only going to need port 80 open for those for web services to be consumed and for people to be able to access your particular websites. If you're on the Java version, you're going to need port 8099 or 8399 to be able to access the manager and those web services. Now that's for the end users that are connecting to your server. There's also a lot of communication that goes on behind the scenes between the different components. So between the web ADF and the SOM and the SOC. Now those, it's recommended that you don't put any kind of firewall between those components uh, because they use a, a range of ports which are called DCOM ports. And they can, they can be a lot of different ports open. So you wouldn't want to open those in a firewall. So it's not recommended you, you put a firewall between those components. But if you're just talking about your end user that's going to connect, it's those ports that I mentioned. All right, next question is from James in Rockingham who asks, has ArcGIS server applications been tested to run in VMware or Microsoft virtual machines? And the answer to that is uh, we don't specifically test on VMware and virtual, virtual software. Uh, we do have, they should just work though. You know, if you're on a supported uh, platform, you know, a supported operating system, it should just work. Uh, that being said though, virtual server technology does add extra overhead to your, uh, to your uh, load. So you, you probably only want to run in a development environment on a virtual, in a virtual setting. In a production environment, you probably don't want to put ArcGIS server on a virtual technology. You want to run it on a physical machine. And last question is from Vinay in Fremont who asks, can the SOC and SOM run under a domain account instead of a local account? So by default, when you install ArcGIS server, uh, these are all, the, the SOM and SOC get created as local accounts on your machine. But they can be domain accounts, yes. So what you would need to do is you need to set up your domain accounts ahead of time. And when you're installing ArcGIS server, when you get to the post installation, you're just going to browse to that specific domain account. Now, why would we want to run it in a domain account? Usually in the case of if you've got multiple SOC machines that need to access or talk to each other on the network, you may need a domain account. Or if you've got data on different parts of your network, you may want to have a domain account so it's just a single account that you can set up access to all your data. Okay, so that's all we have for questions right now. I'll pass you back to Alan. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, so for now for the review question results. So, as you can see here, the correct answer is C, and it looks like that most of you got that right, so glad you're all paying attention. So, you, as the administrator, have to set those permissions explicitly to the ArcGIS SOC account. All right, the post installation won't set up any permissions uh, for you to any of your JS resources. All the post installation does is set permissions uh, for the ArcGIS SOC process to successfully run in the background but doesn't actually set up anything for any of your resources. You, as the administrator, have to set those explicitly. So, good, good job to all of you that got that right. So, here in the final section, we'll cover some of the detailed service properties, uh, which will help us better understand and manage our services. And we'll also take a look at the tools we will use in order to set and configure these properties. So, we'll start off by looking at the different properties we can configure for our map services. Now, many of these properties will carry over to other types of services, but for the sake of this uh, lecture, we're going to focus on the properties for map services. All right. So after we get into the properties we can configure, we'll get into the tools we can use in order to manage these properties, namely ArcGIS Server Manager, which provides you with a web interface, and Arc Catalog, which is part of ArcGIS Desktop. So the first thing I like to note about Arc Catalog uh, when you're modifying the service properties 
is that the service must be stopped in order for you to make changes to it. So here we can see that the California service is stopped, uh, indicated by the red square uh, in the left corner of the service name. So once the service is stopped, you can right-click it and choose Service Properties from the context menu. If you use ArcGIS Server Manager to modify your service properties, the service uh, will be automatically restarted for you, so it doesn't actually have to be stopped. So you can see here that this service is started, and when we click the pencil icon over on the right-hand side, that'll allow us to configure our service properties. So some of the properties you can change on your services are listed here, such as enabling web access, pooled or non-pooled services, low versus high isolation, and caching map services. And we'll go into these in greater detail on the following slides. So first off is the option to enable or disable web access. So if web access is enabled, a web service endpoint gets created on the web server and this enables HTTP communication with your service. This will make the service available to anyone on the internet that has a client capable of consuming the service, such as ArcMap or ArcJS Explorer. If web access is disabled, only clients on our local area network will be able to use this service using a local connection. Internet clients will only be able to see the service if we've created a web mapping application, which of course must be configured using a local connection. So you can enable or disable web access right from the context menu of the service or in the capabilities section of the service properties. You can also further restrict what operations are allowed from web clients. So for example, maybe you only want to allow map viewing, but don't want the user to be able to perform an identify or download of the data. So all you'd have to do is uncheck the query and data checkboxes, and then you leave the, max, the map checkbox checked and that will only allow them to look at maps. So in the pooling section of our service properties, we have the choice to specify our service as pooled or as non-pooled. So the default setting uh, is to be a pooled service in which all of the instances of your service are shared among the clients. Now an instance can really just be considered of basically an instance of ArcMap uh, or that's map service running on your server. All right, so in this case, the client will send a request to the pool and an available instance will generate the response for that request. Once the request has been completed, for example, the drawing of a map, the instance is then returned to the pool and is ready to service another request from any other client. This option is much more scalable because when the clients aren't actively making requests, the instances are available to other clients. So that's different from non-pooled services as each instance is fully dedicated to a single client for the duration of the entire session. So this enables a client to make stateful changes to the service as is required with any specialized JS functionality that needs to change the nature of the service. So for example, if you're making versioned edits in a web mapping application, your instance will need to connect to that version that you are editing. Since you're the only one that can use this instance, you'll be the only one that can see that version and which contains your edits. So when the session terminates, the instance is destroyed and recreated, so now it's available to any new client requests who can then look at their own version. So unless you have a specific reason to use a non-pooled service, I would just keep your services set as pooled. So in addition to specifying the number of instances and whether they are pooled or non-pooled, we can also choose how these instances run within the ArcSoc EXE process. If we choose low isolation, each instance will run within the same ArcSoc EXE, but as a separate thread. However, if there's a problem with one of the instances that caused the process to fail, all the instances uh, or the threads that are running within that process will also fail with it. The benefit here is that this option will give you a much lower memory footprint because now you're only running a single process in the background. Now with high isolation, each instance runs in a separate process in the background. So if one of the instances fails, only that instance is affected because the other instances are isolated in their own separate processes. So this will give you more ArcSoc EXE processes running in the background, which will obviously increase the memory footprint for that service. So let's say you have two services, one with a lot of layers called main map and a simple service called overview map. 
Since the Overview Map service is fairly lightweight, you might be able to save some RAM by setting it to run in low isolation. For the main map service, uh, you may want to isolate the processing of requests for this service using high isolation because you wouldn't want to overload a single ArcSoc process by asking it to do too much. So if you're having problems with some of your services failing, I would probably put it into high isolation in order to isolate those failures. So caching map services is a little different from the other service properties in the way that it requires the service to actually be running in order for you to change it. Now that makes sense since if the service wasn't running, you wouldn't have anything to make requests against so that you could build your cache. So what building cache does for you is to generate a set of pre-rendered static map tiles on the web server and for every extent in your map service. So then when a request is made for that service, the tiles are returned right from the web server and doesn't put any load on your GIS server. However, since the tiles are static, any changes to the data won't be reflected in the cache. If there is a request for a non-cache service, the JS server will have to dynamically generate the map by accessing the data, which of course takes time to process. All of the processing for cache services has been done up front, so a cache can greatly reduce the load on the GIS server. This is only true after the cache is built, as building a cache can be a fairly intensive process. Now, building a cache can take a lot of time and disk space. How much time and space it really takes is dependent on many factors, such as the number of layers, extent of the data, number of scales, uh, complexity of rendering. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, that it depends on, but it's really not unheard of for a cache to take days or even weeks to generate. Uh, all I can suggest, suggest for you is to start off small until you get an idea of exactly how long each scale level will take to build. For more information on building caches, uh, please see the free recorded seminar titled Authoring and Publishing Optimized Map Services, which covers caches in a lot more detail. So when making these changes, we have two applications available for managing our ArcGIS server instance. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is ArcGIS Server Manager. So this is a web-based application that allows us to manage our services. So you can log into it via the internet or intranet and then perform your administrative tasks. There are also properties we can configure for the server as a whole, accessed via the JS Server tab within Manager. So here we can configure and query our log files, which will help us in troubleshooting any problems that we may have with some of our services. We can also add additional host machines if licensed, which will increase the capacity and distribute the load of our site. We can also add additional virtual directories, uh, which can be done here. And this might be a good idea if you know we're going to be building a large cache and the current cache directory does not have enough space. Now, for the Java edition, we also have a tool and manager for generating charts to display service statistics, which help us identify how our services are performing. And for the Java edition on Unix, there is also a utility for managing our users since obviously the AGS admin and AGS users Windows groups won't exist on a Unix system. And in addition to configuring the server properties and creating services, ArcGIS Manager gives us the ability to create and maintain dynamic web mapping applications. This will make our services available to browser-based internet clients. So you can also edit the properties of that application after it's been created so if you decide you'd like to add in a geoprocessing task later, ArcGIS Manager will let you add that in. So the other application we have available for administering uh, ArcGIS Server is Arc Catalog. Uh, this is a standalone application, part of ArcGIS Desktop, that will allow you to make changes to your site when on your local area network. Uh, you can still view services through the internet using Arc Catalog, but you cannot make changes to them. So many of the server properties are the same as we've just seen in ArcGIS Manager, such as configuring logging, adding host machines, and adding virtual directories. So one difference you'll see here is the Statistics tab, uh, which this gives you uh, some of the detailed service statistics, and this information is similar to what the Chart tool in the Job Edition will show you in Manager. 
So another difference is that there's no way to view or query the log files within our catalog, nor is there a mechanism for building web mapping applications, as these are both exclusive to ArcGIS Server Manager. Now, one last topic I'd like to cover are some of the help resources available to you and some things you should know about them. First off, uh, all of our help documents can now be found online at webhelp.esri.com. Here you'll find different sections for ArcGIS Desktop, Server, ArcGIS, and so on. And these are updated regularly as new information becomes available. So obviously the ArcGIS Server Help will be a good place to start looking for information. It contains links for both the Java and .NET platforms as well as developer links to the ESRI Developer Network site. So if you're looking for information on ArcSDE, that can be found actually within the desktop help under the topic Geodatabases and ArcSDE. If you've been looking for the ArcSDE configuration and tuning guides that were part of previous releases of ArcSDE, this information can also be found here as well. And there's also a link on the web help for the ArcGIS uh, server blog, which is a good resource if you're looking for code samples. So now I'd like to show you how to change your map service properties using Arc Catalog and the effect that will have on the background processes. So here in Arc Catalog, uh, the first thing I want to do here is I'm going to, uh, for this purposes of this demo, I just want to have a single service running. So I'm going to stop my Redland service. Right. Uh, and now what I want to do is I want to configure the properties for our catalog. And so what I first thing I need to do is also stop this one. And now if I open up Task Manager, we'll see I won't have very many SOC processes running. So here we can see I only have two SOC processes running. And you'll always have two SOC processes, even if you don't have any services running. So these two are just used internally by ArcGIS Server. So if I configure my service properties, for my California service. You can see here, I've got some options to specify the map document and some of the output and cache directories that are used for this service. In the capabilities, I can use some of the, change some of the different capabilities that are available for the service, such as KML or WMS. So if I select on these, you'll notice that that changes some of the options I can, and I can control those from within this capabilities tab. So for on the mapping capability, this is where I would enable or disable web access, or maybe change some of the operations that are allowed for that map service. And the pooling tab, this is where we change uh, whether the service is pooled or non-pooled. Uh, I'm just going to keep this one as pooled, but what I would like to do is increase the number of instances uh, to be four with a maximum of six. And I'm going to keep this as high isolation, so I'm going to run all of those four processes within uh, separate processes. So we'll see how that looks. So I say OK. That changed the properties. Now when I start this, the service is going to start up. If I come here to my task manager, you'll notice now I have my same two arc socks that I had before. And now I have four additional socks corresponding with the minimum number of four instances that I had for that service. So now let's change this to use low isolation in my service properties. And if I choose low isolation, then start the service. Now when I open up Task Manager, now we'll see I have my same two, but now I only have a single ArcSoc EXE, which has, gives me a much lower memory footprint than if I had four of them running at once. So now all those four instances are running as threads within this ArcSoc EXE. OK, one other thing I'd like to show you is uh, the help. So if we go out to webhelp.esri.com, right, that will bring us to all of the web, uh, doc, the, uh, web help, uh, the documentation for ArcGIS Server, ArcMS, a little on ArcGIS Explorer, and for ArcGIS Desktop. So if we go to the ArcGIS Server help, Notice that there's separate helps for Microsoft.NET and one for Java. And then down here, there's also one for the ArcGIS Server Development Blog. Right. So if I click on these, it brings me to the online help, uh, which you can also install locally on your system with the product. But this online help gets updated regularly. So 
any times we get more information or maybe need to change something, we'll update that on the web help. So generally recommended to use the web help if you have an internet connection. It's a lot of good information in here. I would recommend going through a lot of this. You'll notice there's also a whole section on administering the server, which has a lot of administrative tasks that you will need to perform. Okay. So uh, we so we just went to uh, seeing how to configure uh, some of the service properties and review the tools that you, we can use. We also cover, covered some of the online help resources. And now we've got time for some final questions. So over to Mike. All right, thanks, Alan. So we have a question from Eric from Papillon who asks, why do I have so many SOC processes running? I have like 10 to 12 SOC processes, but only have two services and one tool that are running. Well, it comes back to how you set up your server. So as Alan was just describing in the last section, we've got a minimum number of instances and a maximum number of instances. So if you set your minimum to one, you would have at least you know, one SOC process for your two services and your tool. So you'd have three SOC processes running. And then you've got a maximum instance set. So maybe you set your maximum to 10. So over time, as people connect to that server, you're going to get more SOC processes that are going to spin up and start running. And then eventually those are going to uh, drop back down to the minimum number. Uh, if you've got extra SOC processes that you're just seeing that you don't think should be there, even if you've shut down your server, something may have gone wrong and maybe a SOC has crashed or something. You may need to clean that up. All right, next question is from Peter in Cape Town who asks, would it be better to host your web mapping server on a separate server from your main ArcGIS server or your enterprise database? And this really depends on what you're doing. So if you've, usually most people start out with a development server and they put everything on a single machine. But over time, as your site grows and you've got more and more users and more traffic, yes, you may want to separate out those components and put your, your websites and your web mapping applications on a single server and ArcGIS server on a different one so that you know, you're basically separating and saying web requests are being held, handled by one server and GIS server requests for maps are being handled by another server. Now, when you do start to separate out components, it does get into some uh, changes in licensing. So you should check with your, your account rep for uh, what kind of licenses that's going to require. Okay, we have Carol from Rochester who asks, I've seen and heard some conflicting reports as to whether it's the SOM or the SOC account that needs access to map and data resources and other system folders like Windows Temp. Can you clarify which account needs access or is it both? That's a great question. So the SOM account only needs access to the ArcGIS server directories and it's basically its own directory structure so it can access the SOC and it can access the log files. The SOC account, that's the important one. So the SOC account, this is, needs, you need to grant it access to your, your, any MXDs that you want to publish, any file-based data, and any resources, things like ArcSD connection files or toolboxes that may be contained in the map. If that ArcGIS SOC account doesn't have access to any of those things, that's what's it's going to fail, either creating the service or you're going to get a blank map. Okay, next we have a question from Beth in Irvine who asks, uh, if your ArcSD data resides on a separate database server from ArcGIS server, uh, does the install process automatically set up that ArcGIS SOC account on the, on the database server? And the answer to that is no. So it's only going to install it on the, the ArcGIS server uh, machine. You're going to have to physically go over to your ArcSD machine and create that, that ArcGIS SOC user. Now, a, a side note to this is the ArcGIS SOC user is only required on the database side if you're making a direct connect to ArcSDE. If you're doing a typical three-tier connection, it's going to use your database users and you're not going to actually need that SOC account over there. Okay, and another question kind of related to that comes from Nathan in Bloomington who asks, uh, I've got an enterprise uh, ArcSDE server running Microsoft SQL Server and do I need to assign the permissions to that from our catalog or from within the SQL Server Manager? So for an enterprise server, you're going to go into SQL Server Manager and grant that ArcGIS SOC account the, the permissions. Again, it comes back only if you're doing a direct connect. What you would do in our catalog is if you're using uh, the ArcSDE for uh, 
ArcSD Workgroup Edition or ArcSD Personal Edition, you're going to manage those permissions from our catalog and grant them there. All right, uh, Rohit from Mumbai asks, uh, what is a pooled map service? So Alan kind of described this in the slides, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it again and explain some more. A pooled map service is where multiple people, well, there's a pool of these ArcGIS SOC instances that are running, and multiple people are connecting to the pool, and they, they pull out an instance, they use it maybe for a few seconds while they generate a map, and then they put that instance back in the pool. So they're being shared amongst multiple users and multiple clients. A non-pooled service is where every client that connects is going to have its own dedicated SOC process kind of for the life of that application. So say Alan here opened up an application, he connects, he pulls out uh, a SOC process and he's going to use that while he you know, does all his, generates a bunch of maps and, and maybe does some editing and whatnot. And then when he's done and he closes that application, then that SOC process is released. So a pooled service is going to be much better for uh, allowing a lot more users to be able to access your services. Non-pooled are more for specific applications where each person needs to have access to that SOC for a dedicated amount of time. Okay, Heath from Jackson asks, when using virtual directories, which account needs to have access to the location uh, for caching? So the answer to this is the ArcGIS SOC account needs to have write access to that virtual directory, and usually it's C, ArcGIS server, ArcGIS cache, and because it, it needs to be able to write all those files there when it's building the cache. Now for the end user, uh, if you're using .NET version in IIS, you're going to have to have the iUser account, which is like an anonymous account that's able to access and fetch those cache tiles and send them back to the client. Okay, next question comes from Alan in Rally, who asks, does the high isolation mode allow you to take better advantage of servers with multiple processors or, or multiple processor cores? And the answer to this is uh, no, high isolation doesn't have any, anything to do with how the load gets distributed between processors or processor cores. All of that's gonna be taken care of by your operating system. So you as the administrator really don't have any control over that. Your, your operating system will decide if it goes to the, the first processor or the second processor. And finally, last question from Betty in Houston asks, is there a tool in Manager to monitor site usage by internet users? So it comes down to, again, depending on which version you're using. If you're using .NET, there is no tool specifically in Manager. If you're using the Java version, there is some graphs and statistics that you can get to, uh, to check your site usage. Now you can go into our catalog and go to the statistics tab in our catalog when you're connecting to GS server and get a lot of great statistics about what's going on with your server you know, how many requests and how many hits and what the server is doing basically. Another great place to look for information for this is the ArcGIS server log files. So it'll be able to tell you how many requests came in and you know, particular services are getting hit more than others. Okay, so that's it for questions. Thank you for asking lots of great questions and I'll pass you back to Alan. Okay, thanks, Mike. So, unfortunately, it looks like we're out of time, but uh, before we go, I'd like to point you to a few resources. Uh, so, first off, there are several free web training classes, uh, just like this one, that can be found on uh, our training website. So, there's also several instructor-led classes, which will give you a nice practical understanding of the software and actually get some uh, you know, personal attention from, from the instructor. Also, you might want to look at some of the white papers uh, that are listed here, the System Design Strategies and ArcGIS Enterprise Security uh, white papers. Those have a lot of good, valuable information for administrators of ArcGIS Server. So also, before you go, your comments will help us improve our seminars. So please, I urge you to take a moment to complete our survey. Just click the Give Us Feedback link to take that survey. So we hope you've enjoyed today's seminar. And on behalf of ESRI, I'd like to thank you all for attending.